Well, God bless you and welcome to Your Divine Appointment, which is the media ministry of the Devon Jackson MD Ministries. I'm Dr. Jackson, welcome. We're so delighted that you've joined us here to study the Word of God in Thursday School. Thursday School is Sunday School on a Thursday. So we bless God for the privilege to study the Word of the Lord uh, and uh, we will be studying the International Sunday School lessons. So if you don't have a Sunday School book, you can Google the lesson. We'll be on lesson uh, for the date of July the 5th, 2020, the first Sunday in July. And our lesson on today is Vindicating Wisdom, lesson number five. So you can look up that lesson. Uh, you can also turn in your Bible. We will be in the book of St. Matthew chapter 11. So we bless God for you. Uh, we want you to know that all of these uh, Thursday school, Sunday school teachings are found on our uh, YouTube channel. You can go to YouTube and search for Devon Jackson, MD. Um, and there you'll find over a hundred videos, Sunday morning worship, these teachings uh, and other um, uh, seminars and uh, Sunday morning worship, various services uh, that can be for your spiritual enrichment and also to share with others. And we do ask if you would, when you go to YouTube, if you would subscribe, that would raise our rating with YouTube so more people can find us and we can fulfill the heavenly mandate, which is to tell people about the sun. So we praise God for that. Also, you can find us on Facebook and we ask you to join us there as well as on Twitter and Instagram. And we praise God. Also, our website has a free downloadable Bible study materials. Our website is www.djmd.org, djmd.org. And we pray that the materials there will be a blessing to you. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the privilege to study it. Now open our understanding. Cause us never to be the same again because of an encounter with you this day and your word. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Thank God and amen. Well, if you've been with us the last uh, a month we have been studying all about wisdom and we have been in the book of Proverbs. We are continuing our study of wisdom, but no longer in the book of Proverbs, we're moving over into the Gospels. And so we will be spending these next few weeks uh, in the Gospels looking at wisdom, particularly um, as evidenced and taught through the life of the Savior. And then we will be concluding this study of wisdom in the book of James. Hallelujah. And uh, James, we know, being the half-brother of our Lord and a mighty man of God. So there will be precious things we will learn in the book of James. But today we are in the book of St. Matthew, uh, July the 5th lesson. And this is lesson number five. Our subject on today is a very wonderful one. It's Vindicating Wisdom. And I'm very excited about today's lesson and these, these ensuing lessons. They're very rich and very potent. Uh, but today is Vindicating Wisdom. Basically, to vindicate something is to bring its name back into proper standing. Usually when someone's name has been brought down, whether by rumor, innuendo, uh, accusation, uh, there's some cloud over their name, there's some questionable uh, things, some rumor, uh, but when a person is vindicated, their name is restored, their standing is restored. Well, interesting, in today's lesson, we're talking about vindicating wisdom, and we're going to see how it applies here. Um, and as we had shared before, each um, time that we are in our lessons now, we're doing a Bible spotlight. And uh, we pick something as a particular topic by the grace of God that will be a blessing to each of you that are studying along with us. And today, uh, in our uh, spotlight, we're looking at what is called the intertestamental period. The inter, I-N-T-E-R, testamental, testament, A-L. The intertestamental period. What that refers to is, that's one of these uh, theological terms that refers to the years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Now, uh, because these are both testaments, and the word testament, of course, meaning covenant, the old covenant and the new covenant, uh, that period that is between there is the intertestamental period. 
and that period of time is approximately 400 years. And it's very significant that uh, some things transpired during that period of time, and we just wanted to highlight that as our Bible Spotlight. Very significantly, we want to mention three things that happened during that period of time. We know that the Lord himself, uh, many people call these silent years, because during these four centuries, long time, the Lord did not send any fresh word from heaven. There was no new prophetic voice. The Lord did not send a new word. They didn't have a Jeremiah. They didn't have an Isaiah. There was no Elijah or Elisha that showed up on the scene during those 400 years. And during the time when God was silent, man should have been the same. When God is saying, be still, we should do what God is doing and we should be still. But man wouldn't be still. And during this time, we see the rise of three uh, very significant entities that will see their impact during the life of the Savior in the New Testament. One of the things that we see, and this is, of course, a historical political element, and that is we see the rise of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, of course, will be that group that's in political and world uh, domination uh, at the time of the birth of the Lord Jesus and his ministry as well. Now, the Roman Empire is very significant spiritually because, of course, it was the Romans at their hand that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. Jesus of Nazareth, the man, was crucified at the hands of that Roman Empire, which rose when men should have been quiet. Hallelujah. Now we know that even though it was in fact the hands physically of the Romans that crucified the Lord, it was really at the spiritual hands, at the behest of the spiritual leadership of the Jews that this occurred. So the Jews were the instigators and the ones that called for it. They said, crucify him. They said, uh, give us Barabbas. But instead uh, of releasing Jesus, give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. That was the doing of the Jews. But the physical hands that did it were the Romans. And they rose during that intertestamental period. A second thing uh, that occurred during that time was the rise of the Pharisees, amen? And then the third element we want to mention was the rise of the Sadducees. Both of those religious sects, S-E-C-T-S, -E occurred, they originated during those 400 years. So we find that the Jewish people, not only did the Roman Empire rise, but the Jewish people now were organizing these uh, religious, amen, um, of organization or sex, these religious groups during that period of time. Initially, the Pharisees were known as those who were very strict about the law of Moses, uh, very detailed. They uh, meant to dot every I and cross every T. But over time, they added traditions of their own and beliefs of their own. And those were added in and mixed in with what God had said. And they ended up with a mixture. And that mixture was no longer the pure word of the Lord God. And we see those activities of the Pharisees during the ministry of Jesus. They often were those that challenged him uh, pertaining to things of the law of Moses and trying to find fault with him, trying to find him in a mistake. But they didn't know who they were dealing with. Hallelujah. Because Jesus was God, man, God in human flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. And you're not going to deceive God because before you arrive, he knows you're coming and he knows their agenda. But the other group that rose during this time were the Sadducees. The Sadducees were also the uh, uh, amongst those that were the spiritual leadership of the nation of uh, Israel. Now, the Sadducees tended more so to be those who were aristocratic, those who were uh, of wealth, those that were of uh, uh, high rank in terms of their pedigree and uh, their their uh, lineage, and uh, they took pride often in that. Um, and not only that, they had very limited uh, spirituality in that they did not believe in angels, 
They did not believe in the resurrection. Um, and so they also were very limited in that many believe they only acknowledged the five books of Moses and not the rest of the Old Testament, the books of prophecy and uh, uh, the books of uh, 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 history and so on that are in the Old Testament, they only acknowledged the five books of Moses, didn't believe in angels, didn't believe in spirits, did not believe in the resurrection. These groups, uh, both Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, were those that challenged the ministry of the Lord Jesus, and they occurred when man should have been still, man got busy. So we want to learn from them to Follow the lead of the Lord. When God is quiet, so should we be. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, moving on in our lesson today, we just wanted to lay that uh, as our spotlight on today. Now, our lesson is found here in the book of St. Matthew. Um, and we know that the uh, difference between the Old Testament and the New, uh, basically the thing that defines the beginning of the New Testament is the birth of the Lord Jesus. The Old Testament ended, of course, uh, with God pronouncing essentially uh, a judgment that the people had come back from Babylon. They had not been faithful. They had started to build the temple of the Lord and then got sidetracked with other matters and various things in terms of their commitment. And the Lord ended the Old Testament Testament saying, uh, uh, you're, you're not going to hear from me until Elias or Elijah comes again. And now in today's lesson, Elijah has come. Hallelujah. And so uh, here we find in the book of St. Matthew, chapter 11, verses 7 through 19. Amen. Um, we begin here with verse uh, 7, and it says, And they, and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John, talking about John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Um, it says, what, uh, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? And Jesus asks three questions. He said, what did you go to see? Here's his first question. Um, uh, what went ye into the wilderness to see? A reed shaking in the wind? That was the first question. Secondly, he said, but what did you go out there to see? What were you looking for when you went out there and you saw John? Were you looking for a man who was going to be clothed in soft raiment? That was the second question. Uh, and then he says, behold, uh, those that wear soft raiment, they're in king's houses. Third question, but what did you go out there to see? Did you go to see a prophet? He says, yea, and I say unto you much more than a prophet. Let's look at these three questions. Jesus now is challenging those around him because uh, many have called into question the ministry of John the Baptist. And of course, uh, we know that John the Baptist was the forerunner of the Lord Jesus, having been born about six months prior to him, and an incredible story, a series of miracles pertaining to uh, John's birth. And let's highlight some of those. The first of those many miracles was that uh, John's parents, uh, Zachariah the priest and Elizabeth, these were devout people. They loved God, tribe of Levi, amen, servants in the house of God, but they were advanced of the age. It was past the time. No one thought that they would ever have children. And as it turns out, the second miracle is that uh, while uh, Zachariah is offering a, a, a worship being diligent and faithful in his duty as a priest, hallelujah, an angel shows up and says, Zechariah, you're, you're going to have a son. And uh, Zechariah, of course, did not believe. So the second miracle is that there's an angelic visitation announcing that John's coming. Well, that's not routine for a child, but God announced that John was coming. And then the third issue, of course, is uh, that uh, Elizabeth passed the age to bear. She supernaturally conceives. And then when she is is visited uh, by uh, Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Mary now is early in her pregnancy, but Elizabeth is, of course, six months uh, further advanced. When Mary uh, enters in and there's a salutation between Mary and Elizabeth, both Elizabeth and John the Baptist are filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh my, John is filled before he's ever born. Hallelujah. And then, of course, the miracles pertaining to the birth. Uh, Elizabeth is, by the miracle hand of miraculous hand of God, is able to bear the son. And then Zachariah's tongue now is loose because another miracle, he had been made dumb. He had been made mute. If you're not going to believe what uh, the Lord says, I'm not going to let you speak anything negative. Amen. 
And some, that's a message for all of us. If we're not going to say what God is saying, the Lord might just say, I don't want you to say anything. So Zechariah is mute during all this time. But when his son is born, hallelujah, the Lord looses his tongue and he gives God praise. Hallelujah. And uh, even before he can speak, he writes down his name's going to be John. People are like, John, how come his name is not Zacharias or some other name in the family? Oh, no, no. God says, and his name shall be John. Look at God. All of these miracles surrounding the birth of John the Baptist. He's somebody very special. And here, Jesus asks these questions. Were you looking for a reed shaking in the wind? Were you looking for something weak, something that was uh, easily controllable? Hallelujah. Were you looking for someone who would fear man more than they would fear God? Well, if that's what you're looking for, you found a surprise. Secondly, were you looking for somebody in soft raiment? Uh, John the Baptist lived out, hallelujah, in the wilderness, and that's where his ministry was, hallelujah. And like unto Elijah, the Old Testament Elijah, John the Baptist being the uh, prophetic fulfillment of the New Testament Elijah, he had a, uh, uh, he wore um, camel's hair and he ate uh, locust and wild honey. Uh, so he had a rough uh, exterior and uh, lived out in the, so to speak, in the wild. So this is not the uh, demeanor of one who would be in a king's house. So Jesus says, when you went out to see John, if you were looking for someone who represents the polished and the acceptable by man's standards, that's not what you're going to find because John served the Lord and he's not trying to fit in to the elite or those that we would accept, those that we would consider great in a king's house. John served out in the wilderness and the canopy over his head was the kingdom of God. And then Jesus asked, thirdly, did you go to see a prophet? Well, yes. And if you went to see a prophet now, that's what you did find what you were looking for. Because he says here, when it comes to prophets, look at verse 10, for this is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before my face, uh, which shall prepare um, thy way before thee. Talking about John preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. It's important that we focus uh, on the ministry of John the Baptist because his job was to prepare people for the Messiah to come. Notice this now. Many were not ready when Jesus came and they did not receive him. Had they received the ministry of John, more would have been ready for Jesus. We can look at them and find fault, but what about us? Sometimes when God is about to do a mighty move, he will again send a forerunner. He'll send an announcement. But if we reject the announcement, if we reject the forerunner, we won't be prepared when God's hand begins to move. So we need to have our ear, hallelujah, tuned to heaven and our hearts softened. So when God sends a preparatory word, we get prepared because there are some things that God is going to plant into the soul of his children. But if our heart has not been prepared as good ground, even though God moves and even though God speaks and even though the season is right, if our heart's not prepared, we'll miss the season of the Lord. And we don't want to do that. Hallelujah. They missed John. They missed him. And thus they were not ready for the Savior. Amen. So then we go on to uh, verse 11 here. Uh, the mercy and the sweetness of God is always evident. Even while God is judging, he's still showing mercy. We praise him for that. Verse 11, it says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of a woman, and that's every human. Jesus is saying, among all humans, among all people, watch what he says. There has not been, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Well, wait a minute. The one that they rejected, amen? The one whose ministry was not protracted and for a ministry of years and years of duration, hallelujah. But yet Jesus says, of all humans, there's not one greater than John. But now watch this very significantly. Sometimes, precious ones, we judge a person's ministry and their efficacy by numbers, by crowd, by duration, but sometimes that's not the actual measure. 
The actual measure of a successful ministry is, did they do what God told them to do? Did they fulfill what God said? That ministry might be two weeks, it might be two years, it might be two decades, but that's up to God. We can't measure it by human standards. Hallelujah. And John was not one uh, invited in and having lunch uh, uh, with the king and, and, and hobnobbing with them. John was out in the wilderness, but he was doing what the Lord called him to do. And it goes on. Jesus says, a uh, uh, man born a woman, not great in John the Baptist, but look at this, notwithstanding, he goes on to say, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. We're going to talk about that. Look at verse 12. And from the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent taketh it by force. Now look at this progression here. The Lord Jesus is saying, uh, John, one of the greatest ever. Yet those in the kingdom of heaven the least there is greater than John. That's because John the Baptist technically is an Old Testament prophet. The reason is, as we had defined, the New Testament ministry begins with the birth of the Lord Jesus, of course, and then his ministry. John preceded the Lord Jesus. So he's basically the Old Testament Elijah, not literally, but symbolically, he is the New Testament version of the Old Testament Elijah, and he is basically a prophetic fulfillment from the Old Testament. He is in the time of the New Testament, but the New Testament begins with Jesus. So technically, John is an Old Testament prophet during a New Testament day. Are you with me? That's why Jesus can say those that are in the kingdom of God, all of us that have been born again, all of us that have come after Jesus, all of us that are in the kingdom of heaven, having been born again, we are all on the New Testament side in the church age, which of course is uh, part of the New Testament. John, having been the forerunner of Jesus, is technically Old Testament. So those in the kingdom of heaven, those in the church age, you and I, those that have been born again, the least of us is still greater than John because we're New Testament and we're in here by the blood of Jesus. Are you with me? Oh, what a glorious principle. Now, and he says, from the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom suffered violence, the violent took it by force. Many, many different uh, uh, theological approaches on that, but the general principle is this. John's ministry was to prepare the people for the coming of Messiah. This is an act of violence. Why? Because the coming of Messiah, Lord Jesus, is about salvation of souls. All souls are prisoners of the devil. Because of sin, we're spiritually a prisoners of war. And the devil has us captive. Jesus is coming, right? John the Baptist coming is to announce Jesus is coming, which is to snatch those prisoners of war violently out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the devil's control, out of a bondage to sin, and bring us into salvation, liberty, victory, deliverance, and sonship to the God of heaven. It's all about reconciliation and restoration of the relationship man had with God in the garden, lost by sin. Jesus, through him, we get the relationship back. It's a battle, it's a war, and it's violent because we are snatched out of the devil's hand because the devil's not giving us up. God is snatching us back. Oh, glory to his name. Wherever you are, can you help me shout hallelujah? The kingdom of God suffered by the violent taken by force. Another uh, element persons include is they talk about how the Gentile now in the Old Testament, the, the gospel, right, the, the, the law of Moses and so on, the truth only went to the Jew. But in the time of the New Testament, the Gentile, almost as invaders, almost as uh, those that are coming in and slipping in and violently pressing into the kingdom of God, they're described as those taking it by force. Because all those who will be saved, uh, we don't have time to turn to it, but if you'll look at St. Luke 16 and 16, it talks about how the kingdom of God uh, is enduring a violence as, as in the sense of all men pressing into it. 
Jew and Gentile now press in. You don't, you don't um, skip into this thing. This is a thing of force. We have to make up our mind. It's spiritual warfare. So we press in, and we as Gentiles pressing in is symbolically uh, uh, an act of violence. But of course, there is an invitation for us to come. Um, but the part there about the violence refers to the fact that it takes fervency. It takes pressing in. It takes seeking God uh, in order to lay hold of the treasures of the kingdom of God. Amen. And it says 13, for all the prophets, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. When we see the word law and prophets, that's another way of saying the Old Testament, which was basically the law of Moses. And then the prophetic books. And of course, there are history books. But basically, the Old Testament is prophecy and law. Amen? Prophecy of the various uh, uh, major and minor prophets and the books of law we got from Moses. Amen? So the Old Testament was until John, which is what I had said on just earlier. Amen? And then we get down to verse uh, 15. And it says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, that last part we see in the book of Revelation. Here it just says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. And this is the same phrase the Lord Jesus uses in Revelation, because even when God is speaking, if we don't have an ear, we still won't hear, even though God is speaking. Amen. Oh, but Lord, help us to hear. Now, Jesus is saying this to drive home to people now. You need to understand who John was. Jesus is saying, I'm telling you who John was. All the law and the prophets were until John. And there's no greater than John the Baptist. All of these things. Who did you go out to see? Jesus driving home. Our subject now is vindicating wisdom, vindicating the ministry of John. Because some had rejected that John was true. Jesus goes on to another step. Look at this. Verse 16. Uh, but whosoever I liken to this generation, uh, it's like a group of children that are sitting in the marketplace and they're crying out to their fellows. They're saying this to their fellow uh, playmates, so to speak. And they say to them, listen, we piped unto you. In other words, we played music. You wouldn't dance. And so then if you weren't in that mood, we, we changed. We mourned, but then you wouldn't mourn with us. You wouldn't lament along with us. So we play music. You won't rejoice. We go into mourning. Uh, and you won't lament along with us, okay? It's like, no matter what we do, you don't receive it on two extremes. Look where he's going. Next verse. For John, John came, he wasn't eating, he wasn't drinking, and they said John had a devil, okay? And then look at the next one. But the son of man, right, who came after John, he came eating and drinking, and you say that he's a glutton, he's a wine-bibber, he's a friend of publicans and of sinners, and then Jesus concludes, but wisdom is justified of her children. What is he saying? John's ministry was one much more austere. John was alone out in the wilderness, whereas Jesus was with the people. John's ministry was a voice crying in the wilderness. Jesus's ministry, he dealt often one-on-one. -on -one. We've got the woman at the well, one-on-one. -on -one. When Jesus calls his disciples, he calls them one-on-one. -on -one. Jesus has personal interaction, soul by soul. Whereas John was more a voice out in the wilderness, uh, open to everyone, Jesus' ministry was more the personal touch. Uh, John's ministry, uh, he did not uh, engage himself with different groups that were in society. He didn't en engage with the kings. He also did not engage himself in terms of the personal touch with individuals of low degree. Neither one. Jesus talked to the king. He challenged him. He said that old fox and challenged him about his sin. Jesus also talked to the poor. Jesus also talked to Gentiles. So all these different extremes and differences between John's ministry and Jesus's ministry. It's like John came lamenting you won't receive him. Jesus came uh, engaging with people, playing music, so to speak. You don't receive him. You reject them both. You're the ones like in this picture. If God sends somebody who is singing and celebrating and piping you music, you won't dance. And when God sends somebody who is more austere, you won't join with them. You reject them. 
What does it say? When the heart of man is hard and has not received the work of the spirit, it has rejected the preparation that God was sending, then no matter what God sends, they'll miss it. And that's what happened to the people of that day. Lord, don't let it be us. And Jesus concludes saying wisdom is justified of her children. The old saying is the proof is in the pudding. What that means is the outcome, the children, the product is proof and evidence of what went on in terms of the parent. The fruit of a tree, children symbolic of fruit, is proof of the kind of tree it is. The impact and the significance of John's ministry, Jesus says, ultimately is borne out by its effect. Because those that did hear John, they were baptized in the waters of repentance. Their heart was made ready. So when Messiah comes, they'll hear his voice. What about you? What about me? Let us receive the preparation of the Lord's sins. So when his hand moves, we won't miss it. And until next time, remember this, the God of the Bible, he's real. Prepare for your appointment with him. God bless you, my brother and sister.